Welcome everyone to the October general meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Thanks again for joining us on this uh, beautiful day. It is going to be a clear night. So once we get out of here, uh, perhaps you can do a little observing. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know I am anxious to get away from the computer. I've been uh, getting ready for uh, tonight's meeting uh, for quite some time because it is October, which means it is astrophotography night. So without further ado, we can go ahead and begin. We have uh, a roughly uh, six or seven members. I can't count my list here that fast, but we have six or seven members that are sharing images tonight. They emailed me in advance. If you do want to share images but did not email me, we'll just kind of have to see how uh, the meeting plays out, see how much time we have. We can always do it toward the very end of the meeting, or if we just don't have time, you can always share your images during uh, the astrophotography SIG meeting as well. So I'll, I'll mention that because we always share images there as well. So since I'm the one talking and I have to talk later in the meeting, I'm going to go first. So allow me to share my screen and I have to let me get my PowerPoint started here. That's the screen I want. So there we go. So you should be able to see the uh, Kalamazoo Astronomical Society Astrophotography Night 2021. Mm. And this is my oh. first time in a couple of years uh, sharing images. I did not share any images last year. I've been uh, too busy doing things for you people uh, to process images because I want to learn how to process with, you know, basically picks insight. So I'm kind of starting all over again. <laughs> And so I haven't really had much time to uh, learn how to use PixInsight and start from scratch. But with that said, I'll show you some of the old uh, standards here first. So here's my opening slide, and you will see this image here shortly. But that's just the fun title slide there. But that's a little sneak preview for later. Perfect. So my first images uh, were taken with the... Leonard James Ashby Telescope and Owl Observatory, but specifically uh, this one here, the Teleview 101 NPIS refractor. So that is a four inch refractor um, tailor made for imaging and it um, rides piggyback on the 16 inch uh, Mead, which itself rides on the astrophysics 1600 mount. So. The very first image ever taken with the Teleview is again, this picture here. So normally we um, share pictures that were taken, you know, in the past year or so, but it's not really a hard and fast rule. So since I didn't see any pictures, mine are gonna stretch before Astrophoto Night last year. So I was at the observatory on May 24th, 2020 last year to take a picture of uh, the waxing crescent moon with Earthshine, otherwise known as the Da Vinci glow because Leonardo Da Vinci was the first to correctly explain why we have Earthshine. Basically, uh, sunlight reflects off this portion of the moon, bounces off the earth and back to the moon. So it's much diminished, but with a, uh, a 10 second exposure here, it really comes through. And I really like this shot. There, there were thin clouds, as you can see, and that really kind of helps uh, enhance the scene. And I think pretty much everything, I, I, I know this is a star, but some other, uh, some other little uh, dots of light might be uh, hot pixels as well, because you know it was May, so it was fairly warm. So you can see I have all of my technical information here, so you can kind of re review that yourself. But this was taken with my full frame Canon uh, 6D. And, and again, you can see it's only a 10 second exposure at ISO 400. So the mount, of course, was tracking. So that's why there's no trailing. And this was processed uh, mainly with Lightroom. So I'm, I'm getting to know Lightroom pr pretty well. So here's another example of Earthshine, but this is a bit closer. This is cropped a bit because I had some vignetting because I didn't have the proper adapter with me. So I had to make do with what I had at the observatory. So again, this is Earthshine, but this is earlier this year, July 13th, 2021, again with the Canon uh, EOS 6D, which again is a full frame uh, DSLR camera. 
taken with NONA, which is what we call the uh, Teleview NP101 IS in the observatory. This time you can see it's a 25 second exposure at ISO uh, 200. And you can really see the rigid detail along the uh, terminator there uh, with various uh, craters and mountain ranges and valleys and stuff like that. So here's another shot with Nona. And this is again from earlier this year. This is during our um, astrophotography workshop where we were focusing on the moon, both literally and figuratively, I, I suppose. So this is technically a waxing gibbous moon. It's like a day, I think, past first quarter. So you, you can see it's pretty close to first quarter. And uh, so I, I'm terrible with my lunar geography, but you can see, for example, uh, Clavius here. But that's the extent of my lunar knowledge. Well, I won't I know more, but I won't bother to go through the whole thing there. And so this is a very short exposure, just 1 1 25th of a second at ISO 100. And again, this was processed in Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom. So since I didn't share any images last year, here are two images uh, side by side, just because I had room of Comet Neowise, our nice comet from last summer. It definitely wasn't a hail bop, but it's definitely the best comment we've had in quite some time. So this is from uh, the shore of Lake Michigan in South Haven on July 13th, 2020. Walking around with a camera tripod with a mask on since this is, you know, right when the pandemic was really getting going. Again, this is with the 6D. This time, though, um, obviously I'm not in the observatory, so I'm using my Sigma 100 to 300 millimeter zoom lens set at uh, 100 millimeter. The F ratio is 5.6 if memory serves. And this is on a stationary tripod, a Monfrotto tripod. And they're both uh, 10 second exposures at ISO 1600. This image was taken first. So you can again see the comet. I just barely, you can barely see the uh, ion tail. I don't know if it shows up through zoom. But I, I never really successfully captured the uh, ion tail in any of my images. But I really enjoy the uh, colors here after sunset. Um, so you can see the difference between the two. The comet's a little lower here. And you see this uh, person that moved through the 10 second exposure. So either, either it's a very kind of a long, longest exposure or this person is the flash. I don't know which. <laughs> OK, so the rest of the images are taken with the KAS remote telescope which of course is a setup that anybody can use. And some of the images uh, that I'm gonna share here tonight were taken by me. Some were taken by other members that uh, couldn't be here tonight or I figured probably wouldn't be here tonight. So the, the first set of images I'll show were taken with the 20 inch uh, plane wave corrected dull Kirkham telescope, the main telescope of course, and the uh, camera on the back here. So here's the first one. So you can see this is the Lagoon Nebula M8 in the Messier catalog. And this was taken uh, entirely, I think, well, I think the date's probably an error there. I think this was taken more June than uh, January. So I forgot to change the date on that because obviously the Lagoon Nebula is a little hard to get in the middle of the winter because that's where the sun is. But it was uh, using the SBIG STX16803 CCD camera, which is a full frame CCD camera. And I think my luminance data here is correct. I used um, uh, uh, 40 images to the luminance filter, 24 with the red, 25 with the green, 23 with the blue. And so that uh, gives me a total exposure of about two hours and 48 minutes. Each image was 90 seconds. So that's 112 total. You can check my math there if you want. And I, I did the initial uh, calibration and processing and picks insight. This does have uh, the works, uh, flat fields, uh, bias, dark frames. We have all those in the library now. So it's pretty easy to, to get a hold of your calibration frames. You don't have to take the time to do it. That's one of the advantages of a. Uh, cooled CCD camera. 
and RCCD out there, um, both of them are always cool, cooled to minus 220. I've discovered with the uh, lesser quality ZWO cameras, you know, when it is warm here, it's hard to get those things chilled to minus 20, but with the far superior electronics of the SBIG cameras, you can get those things down to minus 20 every time. I've even done it when it's in the 90s out, out there. So uh, much, much better electronics. And so I love doing the Lagoon Nebula. Every time I get a new telescope or a new camera, um, or the club does, I like to take an image with the Lagoon Nebula. So it's just a beautiful emission nebula. And uh, you can just see some exquisite detail. So one image that's still in the process of um, being processed, I couldn't quite get it done for the meeting tonight, is the Whirlpool Galaxy. As you can see from the dates here, I've been working on this one for a while. So I started this in uh, May of 2019 and continued in 2020. But those are that's just the dates for the luminance data. I've done a lot more for color, but I couldn't quite get the colors to look right in the image. So I didn't want to share it here until I'm 100% happy with it. Well, maybe 90% happy with it. I'm never happy with any of my images. So, so you can see this is 20 uh, 60 second shots to help bring in the core, but you can see it's a bit blown out, but hold on uh, there. And we have uh, 21 three minute shots and 44 five minute shots. So that's the advantage of uh, the remote telescope is while all of these images were being taken, I was probably watching a movie or something because you're home and you can, uh, you can do what you want. So just this luminance data, this is just over five hours of images with the 20 inch. And of course the 20 inch rides on the uh, Paramount ME2. So I took various exposures because there's a large uh, range in brightnesses here. So one thing that um, PixInsight can do is it can uh, help you create a high dynamic range image. So I used a function called the uh, HDR multi-scale transform with PixInsight. So let me go back again. So there it is when it came out from the processing, you know, when all the images, when all the luminance images were stacked. And here it is again with the HDR multi-scale transform with PixInsight. So just look at that remarkable detail in the galaxy. I kind of flipped out when I saw that. So of course the image here is compressed or you know it's it shrunk down to fit into my little PowerPoint slide here, but I did crop out just the galaxy at full resolution and here it is. So this is full resolution with the 20 inch and the uh, STX16803 CCD camera. So this is just remarkable detail in the spiral galaxy and even the uh, neighboring elliptical galaxy. I forget the NGC number of that one offhand. And you can see a few other galaxies off in the distance and the stars look uh, nice and round. So you can see how well the Paramount guides. And you can see lots of stars being kicked, kicked free here between the interactions of these two galaxies. So this next image was taken by a uh, KAS member, Dominic Pulo. I don't think Dominic has ever actually joined us at our general meeting uh, tonight, but I wanted to share this image for a very specific reason, is um, Dominic has no prior experience at astrophotography. The only setup he's ever done imaging with is the remote telescope. And look at what he's gotten here. So this shows you anybody can use the remote telescope and get really good quality images. So of course, this is the Orion Nebula, both M42, which is the lower half and M43, taken on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2020. And you can see his um, kind of odd uh, combination of images here. So he did, you know, 12, two minute shots and one uh, 360 second shot, like, uh, what is that, six minutes <laughs> with the luminance filter. And you can see the uh, uh, various exposures he used with the color filters as well. So that gives a total exposure of 13 hours and 40 minutes. Um, I think that's correct, or I may have forgotten to add that up from earlier. I think I think that's probably incorrect. So, so you can see I threw this together today in kind of a hurry because I was too busy 
processing pictures. And this is the last one that I threw in too. I just figured uh, what the heck I would uh, throw it in. And so the other two images were taken by uh, Henry Polderman. Henry is a relatively new member and he's a relatively new person too. I mean, he's only a 16 year old kid. He would be here tonight, but he's at his uh, 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 school's homecoming in Matawan. So this is a close up of the North American Nebula, which he titled the Cygnus Wall, because that's what they call this region here. So uh, the des designation of this is NGC 7000. And he did indeed take this uh, over a few nights back in June uh, of this year. And so he, he used the uh, SHO uh, technique of uh, processing. So basically, um, SHO means uh, red was assigned, or the sulfur two was assigned to the red filter. The H alpha was assigned to the green filter and o, the O3 filter was assigned to the blue um, imaging. So instead of RGB, it's SHO with, you know, sulfur, H alpha and oxygen. And so this, this is the uh, 13 hours and 40 minutes here. So I forgot to do the math on the previous uh, picture. And so um, it's a beautiful image. So, so this is what you would call a narrow band image taken with our high quality narrow band filters. I mean, each one of these, the S2, H alpha, O3, each of those filters is $1,200 a pop. At least it was back when we bought them. They're probably even more now. So again, he's uh, 16, doesn't have a setup of, of his own. And so you can see the quality of images you can take with the remote telescope. And so Henry processes it a different way as well. Instead of doing the SHO, he did the HOO, where he, uh, where H alpha is red, uh, one of the oxygen, or some of the oxygen images are green and, and, and the rest are blue. I'm not sure what combination he used. Oh, probably, you know, seven for green, seven for blue. So again, this is the same exact image, just processed a little bit differently. So he basically threw out the sulfur data and use this uh, a hydrogen alpha and O3. And you can see it's um, eight hours and 40 minutes of data, which he, Henry preferred the other one, which, you know, it does re uh, reveal more detail, but that one's pretty good too. You do lose, lose a bit of detail up here. It gets pretty dark. All right, so um, I have showed um, images with the CDK in the past. I, I did that back in 2019. I showed a few images that I took with the CDK and I revealed a, a few more here tonight. But so far, at least at Astro Photo Night, I have not revealed or no one has showed any images taken with the Takahashi. Now, the first one you've all seen, uh, this was in the newsletter uh, a few months back. And this is the image that we processed during the PIX Insight wor workshop back in um, May, I think it was. And so again, this is the Orion Nebula, but also with the Running Man Nebula. North is actually at the bottom here, but this is the way it, it, it came out of Pix Insight. You know, some images had North at the top, some had South at the bottom, but when Pix Insight brought it up, it had North at the bottom. And I'm like, you know, I like it. I'll, I'll keep it that way. So, so here, of course, is the Orion Nebula, and this is the Running Man Nebula. And this is another HDR images, you know, with a whole series of exposures um, done together. So th these are images that I took, but Pete Mumbauer mainly processed. I just tweaked it a little bit. So I can zoom in here a little bit, because again, this is reduced, so you can't see the resolution. And even this here shrunk a little bit, but you can see um, how, how deep this goes. And, and you can see from the previous image, now. I, uh, for the most part, I did pretty long exposures, you know, uh, uh, like 16, 10 minute shots with luminance and uh, uh, 15 each, uh, 15 times 10 minutes each with the RGB filters, because I wanted to get a really deep image of the region, not the Orion Nebula itself, but the uh, nebulosity around Orion. Richard, this is Mike Dupuy. I was wondering if you could show me where the running man is in that um, in the, sure. the, the low run. He, I, 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 I'm having trouble here. It's a little overblown <laughs> here. You, you can't see it as clearly as you usually can, but his head's up here. He kind of looks like Gumby. 
So his head's up here. There's like an arm here, a little arm out here. And there's like a leg there and a leg there. So he's kind of like, you know, in, in mid strut. So he's running on his side. He's kind of running this way toward the Orion Nebula. All right, the last image I want to show is of the Pleiades. Ooh. So with the 20 inch, I showed a close up of Merope, but here is the you know first new image uh, that I'm sharing uh, with the Takahashi here. Henry had his own version of this that he sent me to show, but um, I decided to take a crack at this myself. This is some of my data and some of uh, uh, some data from another member named Tom Peters. So again, that's one of the advantages of, of the remote telescope is you have access to every image ever taken from every user um, that, that you can play with. So some of this again is my data, some of it is uh, Tom Peters data. So it's mainly uh, M45, the Pleiades, but you can see lots of uh, dust and gas from the uh, surrounding Taurus molecular cloud because we, know, we now know that the Pleiades is just kind of plowing its way through the uh, uh, Taurus molecular cloud there, or you know, TMC to his friends. And this was just taken over the course of one night, uh, December 21st, December 22nd, 2020, with again, the uh, SBIG camera. We have identical cameras on both telescopes. And uh, these are, are 12 times 300 in, uh, seconds each with the LRGB filters for a total of exactly four hours with the scope. And so we'll zoom into the Pleiades there. This is still compressed a bit. This is still shrunken a bit, but you can really see uh, the detail here a bit more around the Pleiades. So I probably went over my a lot of time a bit, but I did mention that I would share images from other people that couldn't be here. So. There are my pictures for Astrophotography Night. And again, I hope it inspires many of you to uh, use the remote telescope. I know a lot of you have your own setups, but remember, you live in Michigan, and coming up here pretty soon, the great wall of clouds is going to come in, and that'll be it for you for imaging, at least from Michigan, for the next mm. several months. So it'll be clear out there again soon. All right, let's see. Um, Richard? So that, that's me. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I just have a question about the um, the remote telescope. Yeah. How what's the utilization of that? You know, out of thirty days um, accessible observing, how many of those days are taken up by people using it? Oh, not not as many as we we want yet. Maybe uh, maybe out of thirty days a month. So far, it's probably around a dozen nights a month. That that's just from a handful of people. Mm -hmm. So over. Over 50 people, or maybe cl close to 50, have actually paid to use it, but not very many have. Mm -hmm. okay, and I just want, and I just want to mention, you know, many people say they are intimidated, but if you need like a mentor to kind of watch over you, you know, via Zoom, you know, just let me know. We can we can help you out with that. So we're still kind of getting it going. All right, who wants to share next? We have uh, uh, Dave. Uh, Pete will be joining us later. Um, I can't. Mohammed, is that you? Yeah. Okay, Mohammed, you, you go next. Okay. How do I take over the presentation? Oh, hang on. I got to make that available. Okay, now, now you can share. All right. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Uh, I don't see a share button. You have to, uh, if you put your mouse toward the bottom, you can see the little green uh, share screen button there. Okay. Where exactly is that? Oh, the share screen. Okay, got it. All right. Now you see it? There we go. All right. Oh. All right, well, uh, I have a few captures of the uh, first quarter moon that we're taking at the astrophotography workshop that Richard mentioned. That was on June 18th of uh, this year. Uh, the moon phase was at 51%. Uh, um, the so-called half pi moon, a moon age of 7.4 days. And of course, this was at the Owl Observatory. We utilized the Ashby telescope 
which you all know is a mead, the Schmidt grain, Casa grain, the 16 inch. And uh, all I did was lent my camera and Richard helped me uh, hook it up to the uh, Ashby telescope. Uh, the camera was a Nikon uh, mirrorless Z7 with a T2 adapter. I think we used an extender uh, and the images that we obtained later, I processed it on Luminar 4, which is a software. So here's, uh, so the picture, the pictures that we obtained uh, inspired me to uh, look at the surface features a little bit more closely. And suddenly I was, uh, you know, finding some interesting ones that I would like to share today. I uh, used uh, the virtual um, a moon Atlas 7.0 as a reference to identify some of these features. So the first one I would like to point out is the sword-like feature, if you can appreciate. I think it's like, looks like a sword here. Um, right at the bottom screen, bottom right. I don't know if you can see my cursor over it. Um, it's, um, do you see it? Yeah, yeah we see the so yes, we see it this way. Yeah, it's referred to as a straight wall or a uh, Latin term is rupus recta. And it's actually uh, a rectilinear fault that's situated on the east bank of this mare or sea known as mare nubium. And I believe it connects a mountain called Tibet D to the north with a smaller mountain to the south. So, um, so you see that you have the, the next uh, feature that I would like to point out that I found very interesting was these uh, set of craters which look like uh, an ant or maybe a little man on the moon or perhaps a cartoon character of some sort. Uh, but uh, anyway, these craters, uh, you may be familiar with the famous uh, Fra Mauro crater and then this one is, I believe, Parry and uh, Bond Plant. So the reason I'm pointing out the Fra Mauro is that uh, uh, to, to the north of this, although not seen in this picture, is the landing site. Um, sorry, the landing site of uh, Apollo 14. And uh, not too far from there, to the northwest of that is the uh, um, Oceanus Procellarum, which is the landing site of Apollo 11 mission. Uh, the next thing that I found was that it was interesting was these, um, this mountain range that's called the Hadley Apennine region. And to the west of this, um, you see this uh, cr crater or mountain that's uh, known as Archimedes Mountain. And between this and this uh, Hadley Mountain is a place called uh, Palace, Palace uh, uh, Putridinus, Palace Putridinus. And that happens to be the landing site of Apollo 15. So interestingly, um, you know, found a few landing sites that I could identify. And here is another image that we took that night. Uh, and here, uh, once again, you can see the sword standing out much more clearly. Now, while I was looking through all this, uh, you know, um, I also was interested in knowing where was the landing site of Apollo 11. So, and I came upon an article that uh, stated that you could actually see it with uh, a good uh, quality binoculars. And how do you go about finding that? Well, in certain phases of the moon, like this uh, waning gibbous moon, you could identify the Mare Tranquillitatis or the Sea of Tranquility, uh, one of the largest impact basins that uh, erupted on the lunar surface. And uh, once you have uh, located this, you could you know, find these two craters, which are referred to as Ritter and Sabine, um, and, and follow the edge of the mare to the small, uh, tiny crater called Molki. And if you have found this, uh, the Apollo 11 landing site is just a few crater diameters to the northwest of this. 
So I found that very interesting. And there was a Na that NASA article, you know, the, the inset is shown here uh, with the annotations. Wow, yeah, this is one of the images sure. that I processed, but I would be dishonest in saying that I took this image. <laughs> Actually, this is from a Juno CAM uh, mission and all the images, the raw images are actually available on a NASA website that are available for the public to download and process. So I processed this on Luminar 4, just a few tweaks, and lo and behold, a beautiful image of Jupiter. So here, uh, I would say this is close to the raw image that I downloaded, and this is the final processed image. So, I mean- That's really cool. That. I like that. I really yeah. like that. What made so you e even think about going on there to get uh, those pictures? Because that's terrific. Yeah, there are plenty of pictures. Anybody can go there, download them, process it, and be wowed, you know, amazed by the results that you get. And then uh, later, I believe you can upload it uh, for mm -hmm. everybody to view. So this is the, I, I put the uh, link below here. It's uh, www.missionjuno.swri.edu slash junocom slash processing. So if cool. anybody's interested in taking up uh, that uh, project, uh, going there and downloading a few images, they're available there for anyone to process. Thank you, that's all I have today. Those are great. I love that you use Luminar. Yeah, uh, quite often uh, it, that's all I need. Uh, but sometimes I've used Photoshop too uh, to process some of the images. All right, thank you, Mohammed. You're welcome. Let's see, we've got uh, Dave, Pete, Eric, and Lloyd. Who would like to go next? Got a volunteer? Oh, yes. All right, I Dave. Yes, I'll go, Richard. All right, Dave, you're okay. next. Okay. Okay, I'll try to connect in here. What did I do? You're sharing your Am web I browser. There? We we see your web browser. Uh, <laughs> so make that go away. Yeah, I can't figure it out here. I'm gonna stop share here and try again. Okay. I just can't get my uh, there. I click share, and that's my web browser. What's going on here? Basic, advanced. I don't know what's going on here. All right, Dave, we'll let you figure it out. Okay. So, yeah, go uh, ahead. Let someone else go. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Lloyd, Lloyd or Eric. Eric, okay. Go, go ahead, Eric. Okay. I'm going to see if uh, I can get this uh, screen share to work. And I've got to uh, find my PowerPoint presentation. Let me go for screen two instead. Share that and then get the PowerPoint turned on. And I need to tell it to run the show from the beginning. Are you seeing pictures? I see blue. Blue screen. Okay, blue screen, kind of dark in the corners. Yes. Then we're in the right place. So now I need to get to the controls. So uh, <clears throat> I hope you've got a picture of the Milky Way now. Yep. Okay, that's good, that's good. We're, we're running. Um, I've uh, been tired of sitting at home for a long time. So this summer I went out to uh, Colorado for a workshop on photographing the Milky Way and I have gotten better at photographing the Milky Way. The uh, picture here was taken at the Colorado National Monument. And this was the first night that we were out there. And what we were learning was how to combine the stacked images of the sky background with long exposure images of the foreground. Uh, in this particular case, that's not the way it worked out. Uh, the 
stack of pictures of the background. Yes, I got that part, but I only had a single image of the foreground to work with, and it was not all that long, but it had uh, illumination from a car that was driving by. So I used that one to give me my foreground image. Uh, the camera that I'm using for doing this is a Nikon D5500, and it's uh, using an 11 millimeter Tokina lens. So it's a really wide angle picture. If you look at the image, can you see the cursor moving in there? Yes, yes sir. Sure can. Okay, right over here, this is the uh, uh, Rho Ophiuchi region. Um, There's the bright star there, that's uh, Antares, that's M4, and that's the top star in the back of the scorpion. His head is up here. Over here, this is kind of the heart of the Milky Way. And this little glow over here, this is uh, uh, Grand Junction, Colorado's sky glow. Oh. Over on the other side, the green glow, that's just mm -hmm. air glow. Okay, so now time to move on to the next picture. Hmm. Okay, uh, third night that I was there, we went up to uh, the uh, Grand Mesa, which is the other side of Grand Junction, Colorado. And we went looking for a small pond where we could photograph a reflection of the Milky Way. And uh, you can see the... Uh, uh woods around here there's actually a, a road that runs right back through the middle of all this but you can't quite make it out um the pond when there's any light on it at all you can see down to the bottom and it's just kind of a sludgy looking pond but it was really still water and it was like a mirror so it did a good job of reflecting milky way again up here the roofiukai region the dark band of Milky Way right there is M8. Down here are M6 and M7. And you work your way up, you'll run across a lot of Messier objects working up the Milky Way. So after that workshop, I decided, well, I took a lot of pictures of Milky Way in the past. So I went back and I reworked the processing on them with new techniques I learned. And this is a picture that I took a few years ago at uh, Boone Hill Observatory, which is just northwest of Cadillac, Michigan. Um, and you can see again that uh, I've got uh, good detail through the dark bands of the Milky Way and the brighter bands to the side. The Rho Ophiuchi region is just down in the trees. So, uh, after I got back from Colorado, uh, I got together with my daughter and we went out to uh, Lake Michigan at uh, Little Sable Point and uh, started to do the same process again from the beginning. Uh, the exposure for the foreground is uh, one exposure. It's not 15 seconds. That's uh, a lie. It's a... Uh, uh, doing a real quick calculation. It's a seven minute exposure to be able to get the foreground. And then the uh, stack of 25, 15 second exposures makes the Milky Way. And again, uh, Rho Ophiuchi over here, you can see the dark bands coming down into it. Uh, a lot of structure in the clouds of the Milky Way. Uh, this one runs, Vega is up in the corner here. This is the whole constellation of Lyra up at the top. Altair and Aquila are down here. And you've got the, the bright Scutum star cloud here. And uh, down here, this bright patch is M24. M8 sits down here. And if you come down, this is the end of the tail of Scorpius the Scorpion. Hmm. Okay, let's uh, mm -hmm. go on to another one. So I went off to uh, another workshop. Uh, this one in September to photograph the Milky Way from the Sydney Wildlife Refuge. That is a closed area. You can only get in there with a group 
that is specifically planning on going in there. Uh, the person who runs these group trips into there is Sean Malone, who has a photographic studio up in Marquette, Michigan. It's called Lake Superior Photography. Dot com. And she does uh, introductory courses for people learning to shoot the night sky and the Milky Way. I had all the techniques, so I just kind of was off to the side by myself. Uh, in this case, we've got uh, a little reflection in the pond. And in this case, uh, I didn't have uh, a good place to get a reflection, so I just put some pine trees up as kind of a, a borderline. Milky Way pictures uh, always need to have some kind of a foreground to give you some perspective as to what you're looking at. Uh, same place, a uh, night later, we had a little bit of an auroral glow. That's the orange coloring over in here. And a little bit of air glow, that's the green coloring that kind of runs across the whole image. This is facing north. So that's the star Capella right there. And up here, we've got the Pleiades. And uh, in this direction, this is the uh, Perseus OB Association, Northern Milky Way running through there. Uh, because the water wasn't perfectly still, you don't get any star reflections, but you still do get the glow of the, the coloring of the sky. Uh, by myself, I went up to a uh, campground at Fayette State Park, and it's about a half mile walk over to the park from the campground. So for three nights, I uh, walked over to the campground and did some night sky photography. Um, I've given names to a couple of these pictures. This one I call a wagon load of stars. Uh, this one I call strolling the streets under the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, go one more picture from uh, Fayette. This is uh, what Fayette was famous for. It was an iron smelting town in the Upper Peninsula. It's a ghost town now. Um, the structures are all there. To get the foreground pictures, it's a long exposure photograph, typically. I take the uh, length of the uh, accumulated sky pictures, and uh, in this case, it was uh, 25, 15 second exposures. So that'd be uh, about uh, five minutes of exposure. So I would have shot in a five minute foreground exposure to be able to get all the detail in the buildings in the foreground. Okay, I'm still taking pictures at home. Uh, when I got back from the trip, this is the first picture that I took. It's the uh, Dumbbell Nebula M27. And it's taken through the observatory telescope, uh, Celestron CPC Deluxe 925 HD, which is a uh, 9.25 inch. It's got a focal length of 2350 millimeters. And uh, I, stack pictures. I usually shoot about uh, 30 two-minute pictures for bright objects like this. And I do my processing with Deep Sky Stacker to get the images all stacked together. Uh, Pix Insight to do the stretching portion of the processing. And then I do my final adjustments. In this case, it was with Lightroom Classic. And uh, it's, it's got a nice solid black background now. Uh, there's, there's no grain showing in the background parts. Uh, so again, this was September 15th. That makes it about uh, two and a half weeks ago. And more recently, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, three nights ago, it was NGC 6782, Planetary Nebula in the Constellation Aquila. Uh, same configuration. Uh, different exposures though. Um, when I'm doing uh, fainter objects, I take uh, an hour's worth of data, usually uh, uh, 12 five-minute frames. But the uh, 
focal length, the F ratio and uh, the ISO stay pretty much the same. And again, Deep Sky Stacker, Pix Insight, and Lightroom Classic for processing. Uh, this one was uh, September 29th. Oh, we're getting real close to today's date. Um, up here, you can see a little bit of nebulosity around some of the stars in this cluster up in M33. As a matter of fact, uh, you can see uh, a bunch of little uh, hydrogen alpha regions in M33. And they show up nice and red in these pictures because the uh, Canon 60DA camera, it's cropped frame, so I don't get this uh, big of an image, but I do get uh, uh, the alpha, hydrogen alpha light coming through because of the uh, A on the back end of the name there. Uh, this is an astronomical camera, which is sensitive to hydrogen alpha. Okay, I'm getting close to the end. We're at 12 and 15, so let's see what's next. Uh, this one was taken September 30th, 2021. Oh, that's last night. Um, as we look at it, this is uh, NGC 7331 and the Dirlik group of galaxies. There's about four galaxies here, the bigger galaxy here, and there's some other faint ones. There's one up in the corner there, and I think there's a couple more in this image as well. I haven't had uh, time to run it through to uh, have the uh, uh, galaxies mapped yet. And uh, 13, 14. Okay, this is another one from last night, NGC 7479. It's a little spiral galaxy in Pegasus that's nicknamed the Superman galaxy. Uh, I guess because it's like a, an S, but it's backwards if you rotate it. Um, again, it's uh, one of my one hour galaxy exposures. So it's 12 uh, five minute exposures and they're stacked together in Deep Sky Stacker, stretched in Pix Insight. This one has uh, not been really completely cleaned up yet. So you see a lot of uh, uh, color noise in this image. I'll get that out of there the next time that I sit down to do some processing. Um, color noise basically is uh, from the pixels in the camera. They come in three colors, red, green, and blue. And you can see that uh, a bunch of these are red, a bunch of them are green. What uh, you do to get rid of them is just kind of blend adjacent pixels together a little bit, soften the image. Um, you lose a little bit of detail unless you mask the part of the image that you don't want to, uh, to remove the noise from. Okay, uh, I think this last one is just going to be a plain blue screen again. And I am done, so I'll stop sharing and let things move on. All right, thank you, Eric. Very great. I like to do some of those uh, Milky Way workshops. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Definitely. Hey, hey, Eric, do you have the uh, folk reducer for the nine and a quarter Schmidt Cassegrain? I do not. If you want to borrow one one time, let me know. I can uh, I can set you up. I got one. <laughs> okay, I'd like to do that sometime. Sure. Yeah, just just drop me an email. All right. Uh, let's see. So that's Eric. Uh, we got uh, Dave, Pete, and Lloyd. So who wants to volunteer go. to go next? All right, Pete, you go I'm next. Gonna, okay. Uh, sure. Okay, can you see my screen? Horsey. Yep, got the horsey here. Maybe I'll get this right. Okay. So, this is the Horsehead Nebula I took back in January. Uh, took with my 8-inch uh, Richie Cretion scope in my backyard uh, observatory. Sure. It's uh, nine hours worth of exposure through uh, sure. LRGB filters. So uh, luminance, red, green, and blue filters. Um, the luminance, there was 25 10-minute exposures. Actually, they're all 10-minute exposures through, you know, red, green, and blue filters uh, for a total of nine hours. Um, Off-axis guided, um, processed in uh, PixInsight. Um, 
pretty nice. I really, this is one of my, always wanted a good horsey shot and finally got one. Nice and smooth. Um, definitely worth the exposure time to go in there. Got the nice little diffraction patterns and all that fun stuff. Then let's see here, moving on. Up in uh, Ursa Major, we got M81, Bode's Galaxy. This one, I actually brought my notes for my exposures. This is one of my monster projects for the year. This is uh, 38 hours worth of exposure time I spent on this one. 45, uh, this is 15 hours worth of H alpha. So all the little red dots in these spiral arms, lots of H alpha data in M81. There is a ton, even over here on, um, oh, what's this little galaxy? Um, Richard, do you know what the little galaxy on the side is? Isn't it like one of those Humboldt galaxies or something? Yeah, like yep, hum, yep. Damn, I'm good. Yep, you're on, you're on fire, man. So yes, 38 hours. So I got 45 um, 20 minute exposures through my H alpha filter. And then the rest are 10 minute exposures through the LRGB, uh, my eight inch Richie Cretion again. Um, this was taken back in March. Another, we had a clear streak looks like from March 3rd to the 6th. I just let it rip and just started taking them 60 uh, exposures. Um, Due to luminance, and then about 26 through each of the red, green, and blue filters, um, and then processed and picked inside. It was actually one of the more um, stable nights we had in West Michigan. Um, I was pretty surprised. So we don't get those too often. So um, at one point over the summer, I decided I got tired of shooting long focal length um, exposures, and this for this scope, it's 1625 millimeters is my focal length. So I got a little refractor. So and this is a, a narrow band image um, of the North American and the Pelican, if you haven't noticed it. And this is through uh, O3 filter and an H alpha filter. Um, eight hours and 40 minutes worth of exposure. 12, looks like uh, 12 minutes worth of uh, O3 filter, uh, 20 minute exposures. And then for the H alpha, 14 of them. Um, like what I think this is, was my first, really my first um, first light for this little scope. Um, really happy with this one. Um, again, processed it and picks insight. So there's only two two filters. Um, so I had to map the uh, just the two filters to the RGB, and you get this um, representation of the two, um, you know, color mappings of how you know H alpha and O3 are mapped around. Uh, let's see here. This was back in July, June and July. We must have had a cloudy period in there. And, oh, oh yep, uh, about the same time. Actually, I do remember this. Um, I have a dual saddle plate, so I have both my Richie Cretion and my refractor on at the same time. So this is a Hickson 44. Um, oh, actually, no, this is back in April. Actually, excuse me. Uh, Dave actually inspired me to take this exposure, <laughs> this, this, uh, <laughs> this one. This is uh, 20 hours worth of exposure. And this is up in um, uh, Leo, actually, up by, um, yeah, Rigel, I think up there. But up in Leo, yeah, this is 20 hours worth of exposure time. Um, again, 10-minute uh, exposures through LRGB filters um, through my 8-inch scope. Um, very uh, pretty happy with it. A lot of diffraction spikes you can see, definitely from uh, 10 minutes worth of exposures. Nice little details, nice, just tons and tons of galaxies in here. Get up in Leo, you get all sorts of galaxies. Um, I believe in the luminance, there was like over 50 galaxies, but once I blended it with the RGB filter, some of them get lost, but there's some faint ones in the background. Um, it's really fun when you actually zoom in, you get nice little title details in here, uh, nice elliptical galaxies, um, all sorts. It's a good mix of galaxies just right here for the different types you get. Um, if you, and if anyone was part of Adam Block's um, presentation on just, you know, just looking at uh, how you present stuff, this is a really good presentation. So you got three distinct types of galaxies that are going on here. So really happy with this one. 
And let's see here, back to the refractor here, we got the Cygnus loop, um, a nice wide field. Um, this one's 22 hours worth of exposure time. Um, mostly, this was a new one for me, actually. I actually wanted regular star colors, not um, narrow band colors. So I shot actually RGB colors, uh, filters, um, just um, 15 three minute exposures through red, green, blue. So I can have actually red, green, you know, actually star colors, not just weird colors. And then I blended that with my H alpha and O3 of the um, of the actual veil nebula. You know, so you got the uh, Pick Pickering's triangle here in the middle. Of course, I got the uh, annotation turned on. So um, pretty happy with this this exposure. This was back in August. Surprisingly, we've been actually a pretty productive summer. And then um, hot off the presses, I don't even know if Richard's seen this one. He might have saw the uh, luminance, but I got um, M31 here, Andromeda. And this is 14 hours of exposure time through uh, uh, LRGB filter. Um, I do got 50 hours worth of H alpha to throw into here, which I haven't done yet. I still got to process that. It's kind of interesting because the H alpha is actually lumped over on the right side of the galaxy <laughs> for some reason. And then the actual background of this entire frame is filled with an H alpha cloud. It's like the Taurus molecular cloud is a part of the background. I never realized it, but I got so much exposure that there's actually a molecular nebula cloud here in the background. So, but yeah, so this is, um, my project that just wrapped up, actually last night, I finished up um, some exposures on this one for, uh, I think it was the blue filter I got on this one finished up. So, but yeah, this is what I've been doing pretty much this year. Um, actually last night, I see so there's still all sorts of stuff. Um, M42, M45, um, Gamma Cygni, um, there's all sorts of stuff in the in the works for maybe next year's presentation, but um, been taking advantage of all the clear nights here in, in Michigan, which have been actually, they're out there, they happen. So um, if you have uh, narrow band filters, get out there and use the, when the moon's out, you can take take some pictures with that. So thank you. Pete, is that the Hubble's palette that you're using for color map? Um, Sometimes, yeah, it, yeah. Um, actually, I haven't actually used the traditional Hubble palette on any of all. Oh, last year I did for M M16, the um, Eagle Nebula, I actually did use a Hubble palette. Um, but like for these, I mapped it. Um, uh, hold on, let me pull up my notes here real quick. I knew someone was gonna ask that question. And I don't have my notes here. Hold on one second, please. Okay, for this one, I mapped it H alpha for red, and then O3 I put into the green and blue channels. Um, no, actually, yeah, I did do the Hubble palette for, for this, yeah, so the H alpha was red. The green channel was a little bit of math. I use pixel math and um, pixel insight. It's 0.6 times the H alpha plus 0.4 times the O3 channel produced my green. And then the blue was the O3 channel. And it got this out. That's what's interesting with uh, narrow band. You can come up with all sorts of crazy stuff. And I have another variation I found uh, online, some suggestions. You can really um, go with all sorts of ones. There's, I, yeah, I mean, there's just so much. I mean, I got a lot of S2 data. I do have an S2 filter. That's so close to, you know, H alpha data um, as far as the narrow, as far as the band pass. Um, I haven't really figured out where to use it sometimes. I got quite a bit of it on, on this image. It looks so close to my H alpha data. I never really 
put it into here, but someone suggested, hey, throw it in there because data is data. So I'll get around to, to doing it. So that's what all our, when the great giant uh, uh, Michigan cloud comes in here in what, about four weeks? Is that, <laughs> I'll, I'll start playing around with the, all the data I got. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or? Pete, since uh, Sinclair isn't here, I'll just uh, say it for him. I hate you. Oh, hey, oh, I will say I have shot the Saturn. I did shoot Saturn too. So there's my little Saturn shot. Right. I, 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 I did make an attack. I got a little uh, planetary camera and a Teleview um, 2X. I think I got, yeah, I got 2X Barlow. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm pretty happy with this one. So. <laughs> Well, the thing is, is it's not very high and I'm shooting over my roof. So those are like the two things you don't want to do. <laughs> Shoot over a roof in the summer when the heat's coming off the roof. And then, because um, it's only maybe what, 30 degrees, Jupiter and Saturn, 30. Yeah. It's so super low right now. We're in the wrong, wrong part of the world. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Pete. Yep. No problem. All yours. All right. Uh, Dave or Lloyd, who wants to go next? I can. All I right, only Lloyd. Have a, I only have a couple to show, so it won't take very long. So, um, so this one was a work in progress last year. Um, I hadn't. I had still hadn't captured, um, I think it was the sulfur channel. And so um, I had presented it as a, as an HOO image. Um, but I was able to capture that data um, in October, shortly after the meeting, and combine it into the Hubble palette. Um, this is using a 72 uh, millimeter short tube refractor. Um, and this was still with Matt Garten's camera that he had loaned to me last year. Um, before I gave it back to him in his uh, filter wheel with his Astrodon filters. Um, this was 22 hours of data of the Pelican Nebula. I was pretty pleased with how this one turned out. I really love the detail in here in this part of the nebula um, and all the dust that you can see in the, in the image. Um, this is the Sol Nebula. Um, I captured this one. I usually try to do like one filter a night and just capture, you know, just take a night, an entire night's worth of Im images. And this one, I captured three consecutive nights in November. So how often does that happen? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, same setup, basically, um, the Hubble palette again, again, about 20 hours of data. Um, and I, I, this one's always, this one has many names. I always, I always see a fetus or an infant lying on its back. Um, or if you turn it upside down, I feel like this, do I like do a, too. E if you turn it over at this, I feel like looks like ET's face, but, uh, um, I, I, I love the, like little, the little details in this one as well. There's, there's all these little like cone shaped nebulosity, um, all around the edges. And then, um, this was, uh, uh, Sharpless 171. Um, this one's in HOO, so mapping H alpha um, to red and then oxygen and to the green and blue channels. Um, I love the the shape of this one. This this kind of um, circular pattern here with this bright nebulosity in the center. Um, this one was only about 14 hours of data, but if you zoom in on the center, you can really see some of this this really cool um, nebulosity and shapes of the dust. Um, so I, I, I really, I, I like how that looks at, at the two to one zoom level. So um, this was about the end of the year and I, I'd returned uh, Matt's camera to him and I ordered a new one. It took, as, as you all know, the, the supply chain is an issue and it took forever to get this camera and I literally plugged it in and it broke. So I had to send it back and have it repaired and I didn't get it back until July. So I've only been, I've only had it out like three times. 
but uh, here it is. I, I also bought a new mount and uh, converted it to go to. So um, I have this whole new mount set up. I have the new camera and the new filter wheel um, with brand new three na uh, Antilla filters, um, three nanometer narrowband filters. And uh, I just recently put a wheelie bar on the bottom so it's easy to get in and out because this setup is, it's so much heavier than my old one. I can't lift this all together and move it. So <laughs> I, I got this, uh, this thing so I can wheel it in and out of the garage easily. It, it, it looks a little ridiculous at the moment with this short tube refractor on it, but that's, this is not its final that's form. Awesome. So, uh, <laughs> the is plan your, is to, the plan is to upgrade this to something a little bigger. Is your data cable coming off the counterweight shaft? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's a good idea. Yeah. That way it doesn't get hung up on anything. Yeah. It's always, it's always out of the way. It's the, it's the, um, all that's in there is, uh, an ethernet cable and the power. Yep. Oh, I'm going to try that. Yeah. That's a good idea. So that's all I've got. Did you convert that to an on step? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the second one I've done. And it, it's funny. I, I almost enjoy that as much as imaging, like <laughs> playing with the, you know, the gadgets. So, mm -hmm. so that's all I've got. All right. Thank you, Lloyd. That's great. All right, Dave, you're last. Okay. I'll see if I can do it this time. I think everybody got it. I think I got it. Uh, I didn't really do a whole lot of imaging this year. Uh, I've been learning the good old and pick site here. I've actually got a book and started processing some old hydrogen alpha here of the lagoon. That was one of my first projects and learning picks in sight. So. I don't have all the data on it. I'm lousy at the recordings and all that and keeping the information. This is with the 16.2, I believe. Oh, now let's see here. What else I got here? Uh, I only got just a few pictures here. Uh, oh, I have the good old Cygnus and... Uh, Hubble palette here. I'm really starting to like this uh, Hubble palette. You get all the detail and everything and all the inside of the nebula here. And you get to see these uh, tubular granule things here. It looks like the stars are granules being in these tubes here. I've seen it in a lot of my other pictures too. They're inside these little tubes and you get these dark dust things in there. I think that's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's a new star being born or what. But that was Matt that actually took that and I reprocessed that into the Hubble palette. So that was there. Okay. Oh, come on. And let's see here. I think I got one more here. Oh, that's my horse head. Yeah, I had to get, I got a horse head here finally. Uh, this actually is a cropped in view of the horse head that I took. I actually cropped out quite a bit of the image because I didn't really like the way the color turned out. And, uh, so this was about the best part of the picture. So I got something out of nothing there the way I looked at it. <laughs> so, and let's see my first, uh, galaxy shot that I did on a small one, 530 vocal length is trying to find these smaller galaxies. This is NGC 4244, I believe. Just a little edge on galaxy that I found. Uh, I had to crop in quite a bit just to get it this big because uh, it's fairly small. Which one is and that? And that's about it for me. I said, I haven't done a whole lot of imaging here. Which one is that, Dave? Uh, NGC 4244, I believe. Yeah, that'd be another good one for you, Pete. Yeah, I just wrote that down. That looks cool. Where's it up in Lake Leo or? Oh, where the heck is it? I can't remember. Uh, it's almost oh. straight up. 
Yeah, I think it is in Leo. I think I think I can't remember. Okay, I'm just being lazy, not using the sky. Sorry. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's a nice little edge on. That's my first process cool. in Pixon site. Nice. So very nice. Uh, that's it for me. All right. Thank you, Dave. Okay, so that concludes uh, Astrophotography Night. If you did have any images to share, uh, we can maybe try to squeeze them in toward the end of the meeting. We should have plenty of time. And you're always welcome to share images during the Astrophotography SIG as well. So let's move right into the uh, kind of wow. open discussion part of the meeting. So the first thing I want to mention again is... Uh, don't forget, you can order your new uh, Kalamazoo Astronomical Society themed uh, clothing. So I, I just wanted to show you the, uh, the web page again. So here is the, uh, here's our Zazzle page where you can purchase the clothing. And uh, one thing I wanted to show is, is if you look at the page and think, why does Richard have everything in black? Well, that's what they... That's what they start with. I could make it other colors, but I just wanted to show you that, of course, I have my black shirt on, but if you're like, I don't want black, I want navy blue, where you can just click on, cl click on the color you want. So you can order it in a whole variety of colors. So if you look at the main page and think, I don't want that color, I want a different color, there you go. You can order all kinds of colors. And you can even um, choose uh, different styles of shirts as well. So I, I try to have a few uh, done, you know, preset here that you can order a lot faster. But remember, you, you, you can change the styles, you can change the colors. Uh, and I just recently, over the past month, I added a polo shirt because Dave Wolf requested a polo shirt and he better have ordered one <laughs> since, he, since he requested it. So... Mm -hmm. um, I have, you know, people are, are buying the clothing. I, I, I do see that. It's not as many as I want, obviously. So next month, come on, everyone have a KS uh, shirt on. Yeah. We'll look like an actual club or something. I don't know. That's crazy talk. <laughs> and I just wanted to give an update. The remote telescope is back online. We brought it online a little bit early because the, the forecast was looking really good, like the monsoon season was over. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as we brought that thing back up line, woof, clouds and rain and stuff came back in. So it's been a little rough lately. So, uh, but it, again, you can reserve time uh, tonight. Of course, you can, res of course, uh, tonight is taken, uh, later tonight is taken when Henry gets home from his homecoming. Uh, uh, celebration there uh, but th there are plenty other times available if you're thinking uh, you know well, what about that no good pesky moon remember we have a great collection of narrow band filters those allow you to image even during a really bright moon so there's nothing to stop you nothing nothing uh yeah, got another guest with us look who's here jack roach who's that Jack, Jack Roach. Jack Roach. Jack Roach. Oh, oh, Jack hey, Roach is the silver hairs. <laughs> Where's Don Stillwell? Yeah. Raise your hand. <laughs> well, I can't. I uh, don't have a, a camera for this. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> he did so, have one. He probably broke it. So well, you, you, well, you probably yeah, haven't right seen. Now, I would break it. So, Don, you probably didn't see the article I wrote for Sky and Tell, September. Wow, no kidding. I'm the guy that wrote the one on the, on the gear buggy. Well, I'll have yeah. to go to the library then. Yeah, go to the library. So Se it was last month. September. Oh, page 70. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Jack, did you know that uh, uh, one of our members, who who is it to Richard, has got some uh, blank uh, mirrors and things for like telescope making where you oh, have really? any interest in that kind of stuff? What size? Well, let's come back to this later. You guys yeah. are you, you oh. guys are rudely interrupting well, the presentation. The <laughs> there we go. Everyone's muted now. I have absolute control. So we can't... Hey, hey, hey. I, I will rig it so nobody can mute themselves. So be behave yourself. Um, okay, so where I was is uh, general meeting is we're getting toward the time of the year where it's uh, time to think about next year. Uh, so normally I have 
quite a few ideas. I do have a handful for next year, but my usual sources like, you know, the uh, uh, lecture series at like Abrams Planetarium, both U of M, MSU have like physics uh, seminars. And I, I'm always scouting those for potential speakers. Of course, those have all kind of dried up because no one's had those seminars for a couple of years now. So I am, I am kind of uh, uh, short on ideas for speakers for next year. My idea for next year is at least for the first three months of the year, uh, the meetings uh, might be in person, but one way or the other, I think we're going to have Zoom speakers for like the first uh, three months of the year. So, you know, if you've watched a university professor give a talk online on YouTube that you liked, or even somebody from JPL, you know, email me the link or email me the person and, and the talk they gave, and I'll see if I can invite them to give a presentation, because that's my usual MO. If someone's given a talk before somewhere else, I ask them to give it to us because they have it ready to go, and they don't have to have any serious time commitment, you know, putting together a special presentation for us. So, you know, I, I've been doing uh, speakers pretty much looking for speakers, you know, by myself for a good, the better part of 25 years. So help, I need help. Um, so it should not be a one person club. It's, to be brutally honest, it's kind of rude of you guys to really abandon me and let me do a lot of this stuff by myself. So I'm just going to say it right there. I need help. So help. Okay. Um, moving on for the lecture series, uh, it's going to, the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series is going to return uh, starting most likely on January 15th. Uh, registration will begin probably around November 1st or so because I'm going to do it a little differently this year. Uh, last year I did it the hard way. I entered all the registrations one by one into a spreadsheet, but uh, we're going to automate that a little more this time because you know, last year we had, or this year, we had, you know, over 900 people registered. So that was, that was not fun to enter those uh, one by one, because uh, that's the way that I did it. And I just started this week, my uh, latest, uh, you know, quote, semester of the Introduction to Astronomy course. So if you want to take a 11-week course and learn the basics of astronomy, we've only done the first two basic chapters, so it is still not too late to enroll. So you know, email me and I can send you more information on how to participate in the course. Uh, memberships have slowed down a bit. They're, they're not coming in as frequently as they were, but we did pick up a new one today, as I mentioned earlier. We are currently at 257 memberships, just unprecedented oh, yeah. that we have that many, 257. And if, if you're not a member, remember, you can still join and you basically get the rest of this year for free. And you could be a member till the end of next year or the following year, depending on what kind of membership you get. And I'll mention again that if, if it's time for you to renew at the end of the year, you'll probably get an email from me by mid or late October. So that is it for the president's report. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to observing reports. Anyone uh, get out and actually use their eyeballs instead of uh, CCD or CMOS cameras? Jack? Went out last night uh, with this observing SIG group out to Richland Township Park. Uh, had a, a nice evening. The sky was pretty clear. Transparency was so-so, uh, but uh, an enjoyable time. There were uh, five adults and one youth out there, so it was Okay, I had a good time. Got started on a couple of observing things, made some notes, and uh, we'll see where I end up with it. The paper started getting wet, so I had to quit. <laughs> That's why I got to get one of these to take notes. Got to got, got, get an iPad. All right, anybody else doing the observing with their peepers or with binoculars or a telescope? See, what did I tell you? This is not a observing club. <laughs> and you, you have no excuse. We've, we've had a lot of clear skies. Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay, Don, let's, let's uh, get this show on the road. About, about a week ago, I happened to be in New York City at the top of the rock. And I got a few pictures of the uh, moon. And right next to that moon was Venus. And uh, of course, the below was New York City. And uh, so did a little observing from 
top of the rock. There you go. Speaking of which, uh, make sure you mark uh, October 9th on your calendar because the moon and Venus will be just two degrees apart. We do have a public session that night, as I'll mention here later, but that's a little preview for, for that. All right. I did some observing early this morning at six because someone assigned me that I had to look at Ursa Major. So <laughs> ah. <laughs> I was out there this morning. It was not too bad. Yeah, don't don't name drop who who, who made you observe Ursa Major, but he I don't didn't know who it could have been. He didn't tell you to do it at six in the morning, though. You could have done it a little earlier. <laughs> or waited a little longer. Um but, yeah, yeah, there you go. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, I've observed a few of the things out my back door and uh, the Gemini twins and what, what else? Uh, Orion, the usual suspects at this time of the year. Early morning, late evening. Perfect. All right, here and not, nothing else. Uh, we'll move on to astronomical news and events. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to really read the story in detail, but I read, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope has been monitoring, monitoring Jupiter since it was launched. Uh, and and uh, they've done some analysis of images and discovered the Great Red Spot is uh, speeding up. What that exactly means, no one really knows, but it is. There you go. So it's going faster. That could be good. That could be bad. Nobody like, knows. What's speeding up the rotation or how it's moving What's what part speeding up? Uh, I think the whole thing. It's probably faster in the center and slower toward the edges, but it's uh, it's overall hmm. speeding up. He, he, he means the uh, period of time that uh, you can see it as it makes a loop around the planet. Or yeah, no, it's, it's, it's spinning around itself, huh. not, not, not around the planet. Okay. Well, they've been saying for years that it's shrinking it's getting smaller, so um, actually, if it is getting smaller, the rotational speed should uh, speed up. Yeah. Any other news? I posted something on the Facebook page I found today that uh, we don't always need the sun for the aurora. I guess the Earth can make its own aurora. It's learned after all these billions of years. <laughs> yes, I saw that on Space Weather, yeah. Yep, that's where I grabbed it from. Not that we ever see anything here, but if Earth is going to make its own aurora, we should do a little better job down here. <clears throat> Any other news? Here and none. Okay. Moving on, uh, KAS Event Horizon. Uh, one thing I want to mention for the uh, public observing session on October 9th is we're going to have a group of homeschool students. So we could probably use a few extra uh, people uh, besides what we have in our observatory. Uh, they said uh, they're going to have at least uh, 10 adults and 24 kids. So that's a total of 34 people, but they said there could be of some last minute uh, folks as well. So if you're free on October 9th and we actually have clear skies, um, we could probably use a few extra scopes uh, set up to share with the kids. And then we have another public observing session, which is the last of the season on October 23rd. And who, who knows what that'll be like, you know, the of course, we, we started late because of the pandemic. We didn't start the uh, season until mid-June. But pretty much every season has been either, you know, partly cloudy or turns into mostly cloudy. The only time we actually had clear skies was on my birthday, July 31st. But that's when the smoke really came in and we could hardly see anything. So it's been a rough year. Um, so, I, so I hope we have some clear skies for at least one of the uh, sessions in October. But we haven't pulled off in an in a October session in, in a little while. Uh, the next, we have the Astrophotography SIG meeting on uh, Friday, October 15th, which is two weeks from today. That begins at 8 p.m. And, you know, for, for the last presentation with Adam Block, I promised that it would be more of a general talk, and it, it, it mostly was. 
Um, it wasn't completely general, but but it was mostly general. But this time, not so much. Uh, this one's going to be technical. So this meeting for sure is for those that are really interested in astrophotography. So one of our own members and a former Kansas student, Jonathan Young, will be presenting narrowband imaging considerations and lessons learned from Southern Michigan. And he is an excellent astrophotographer. I wish he could have joined us and shared some images tonight, but he'll be sharing his techniques of uh, putting together narrowband images. And so we're really looking forward to that. And I think um, I think all the programs that he uses to, you know, align and stack and process images, I think they're all freeware. So if one of the limitations of the remote telescope for you is you got to buy expensive software, well, he'll talk about some uh, uh, programs you can you can use for free. Um, so you just really have to pay your yearly subscription to use the telescope. You be recording uh, that session, uh, Richard. What's that? You'll be recording that session? We will always be recording. As long as we're on Zoom, we're going to record. When we get back in person, I'm not really sure. I, I want to record the meetings, but we're still looking for a, a definite volunteer for that. And, you know, if, if I do it, I'm still not sure I want to do it. Because, number one, the YouTube hits hasn't, hasn't been terribly, terribly high. Um, so I'm not sure it's worth the effort, but... But we're gonna uh, we're gonna definitely keep recording them as long as we're on Zoom because it's so easy. Uh, we do have a board meeting on Sunday, October seventeenth. I haven't been putting those on on the newsletter cover because we've had so many other events. I just haven't had room. So if you do want to attend the board meeting, that's uh, October seventeenth at five. You have to email me though to get the Zoom information since we're still meeting on Zoom. And then we have another observing SIG session at Richland Township Park on Thursday, October 28th at 7.30. So uh, it sounds like we have a small dedicated group for the observing SIG, and I'm really looking forward to giving out some uh, observing awards here, maybe in a few months or sometime next year. Because uh, frankly, if, if we're not giving out too many observing awards, I don't know why we're members in the Astronomical League, because they don't really, frankly, do much else for us. And, and again, that stuff costs a lot of money. Uh, prime focus, always looking for articles. Um, again, that's where the membership leaves me high and dry. Like, for example, look at the newsletter of the Warren Astronomical Society on the east side of the state. Look at all the submissions they get from members. And what do I get usually? The answer is jack squat. So, again, you guys are part of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, right? That's a question. If the answer is yes, <laughs> once in a while, you know, not every month, contribute to the newsletter. You guys join the club. Now I'm asking you to be a part of it. You can hear some frustration in my voice because it's getting old. I want contributions to the newsletter. Equipment reviews. Did you take a trip? Did you go to a workshop? Like Eric, I don't, I don't know if Eric's even there anymore. You know, write some write, write a review of the workshops you did. We need stuff for the newsletter. Stop being so self-centered. Contribute. <laughs> All right. Are there any other items to share? Anybody else have Richard. anything to mention? I Dave, have one too. Dave, Dave, go ahead. Uh, I just want to give an update on the uh, telescope I'm refurbishing from uh, Kathy Ashby that she donated. Yes. Uh, George Drake donated a telescope, a small 500 focal length one. The mirror I need is the wrong mirror, but the tube in and the holder looks like it's gonna fit on it. So if I can take that mirror out and find a 900 vocal length mirror, I can replace that mirror and it looks like it's gonna fit right on the back of that telescope. So we need a 114 millimeter mirror, 900 vocal length. Okay, great Dave, thanks. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. So I'm, I'm glad you did. Uh, who, who else had something? I yeah. did. Oh, okay, George, go ahead. Yeah, um, Notre Dame University has its um, Our Universe Revealed series that it uh, does. Although last year they cut it out, cut it out because of the pandemic, but they're starting it up again. First one is this coming Tuesday at seven. Uh, it'll be on Zoom and YouTube, and then if you live down here like I do. 
near Notre Dame that you can go in person as well. First one's gonna be about supernovae. Is that from a Notre Dame professor? Yep, that's all people from the physics and astrophysics department that do that. Okay. Yeah, you should send me the website for that so I can uh, 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 you know, use uh, some of those for potential speakers for us too. Okay, glad so to do that. Those are the kind of things I look for to, to, to find general meeting speakers is a lecture series right. like that. All right, right, will do. All righty. Uh, Jack, you had something. Uh, next Saturday, November the 9th, uh, I will be representing the KAS at Crane Fest over North Marshall. Uh, if somebody wants to come along and join for part of the day, that'd be wonderful. Uh, hopefully we'll have some solar observing we can share with the people looking at the cranes also. Thanks, Jack, for uh, volunteering. To, this is Don Steelwell. Thanks, Jack, for volunteering to do that. And, uh, you know, we saw a lot of beautiful uh, images tonight, and I might suggest that uh, some of those people who had those images that may have had them framed or uh, printed, uh, maybe uh, come along and show their uh, expertise in this field and uh, talk with people about uh, astrophotography and maybe join in our club. Cool. And you'll send me the paperwork for the Crane Fest. And the Correct. Past, yeah, that, that that, that'll be coming out next week, Jack. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, there'll, there'll be uh, parking passes for you and anybody else that volunteers. Uh, and by the way, Jack is the one heading up the KAS's uh, appearance there at the Crane Fest. And what, what are the hours for the Crane Fest? Jack or Don? Jack, why don't you take that? Well, the I think what the official is like 11 to 4 or something like that. Uh, I usually get there about, try and get there about 10 ish to set up and get ready and then uh, just kind of hang around and talk to people. Uh, but yeah, if you want to drop in for an hour or so, that'd be wonderful, even too. The, the official hours are noon until uh, dark. Um, Obviously, if, if you're looking at solar viewing, you don't need to stay uh, uh, up until dark. I think Jack usually uh, plans to uh, start closing up around 5, 5.30, because most people at that point are gathering at the observing areas to watch the cranes come in to roost. And the, and the sun's getting kind of low at that point to try and shoot it with a telescope. Right. Mike, if you or others want to come over... Uh, Send me an email and let me know, and I'll uh, forward the parking pass to you when Don gives it to me. Did you want to talk to you? No, I just want to get uh, still wills. Okay, thank you. Let's get his phone number or something. And we did need someone there on Sunday, too, right, Don? Uh, I believe that's correct. Is that right, Jack? It would be good if somebody wants to go over on Sunday. I'm not available. Uh, Scott had talked about it in the past, but I don't know if he's going to be able to do it this year. And the sun's I do, active, I'll go, but. And I need to know so that if, if I put up a canopy of some sort on Saturday, I can leave it for somebody on Sunday to take it back down. Yeah, if I if I volunteer on Sunday, I'm just I'm just setting up a telescope because I've discovered from years past there's no point in passing out flyers because most of the people you meet are from way out of the area. So, uh, so I would just share views of the sun, do a little like sidewalk astronomy. Okay, Jack wants to get some information on how to contact a few people. Okay. So Don Stillwell. Here, here you go, Jack. If you're if you're able to throw your phone number out, if you don't, that's fine. I'll give you my email. Uh, well, uh, you can go to the website. My email address is actually at the KAS website as uh, treasurer. Okay. And anyway, I'll say what it is. It's S T I L W E L L D B at Comcast.net. Okay. My but you're, out, you're actually on the website, though. Uh, yes. Yep. And you don't have to be a member to find it. Uh, no, it's at the ksonline.org website. Okay. Okay. I just want to contact you later. You know, that's not personal. Good. There you go. I saw Rich Mather uh, today. Oh, oh good. Yeah. I'm glad you, glad you did. Yeah. Yeah. How's Rich doing? Um. Well, I, I, to put it to put it gently, that may be the last time I see Rich. Oh dear. Uh, the memory is uh, the memory's uh, fading. 
Yeah. yeah, he went he went to Richland Township Park uh, last summer to see Comet Neowise with Mike Cook, and he, you know, he lives like minutes from there, and he couldn't find his way home. So you know, that yeah. was the last time. I think that was even the last time he drove. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, so anyway, it's just real tragedy. But uh, we had we had a good visit, had a really good time. So, yeah, we're sorry to hear that. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Don. I appreciate it. Uh, sure. Look forward to hearing from you, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Any anybody want to mention anything else? Okay. Next month we got something a little different, a little special. We're we're still gonna do it on Zoom. We were really hoping to do this in person, maybe even do popcorn and stuff like that. But uh, uh, nope, not so much. Uh, so next month, instead of a presentation or or anything like that, uh, we're gonna have a uh, exclusive documentary screening. Of course, they do it or have done it and will do it at many other club meetings but um, so it's exclu exclusive for us is there's a documentary uh, called Luminous and so Luminous is the story of this um, professor um, oh gosh what's his name let me find the uh, video um, or the yeah so it's the astronomy professor Larry Molnar at Calvin College and he predicts a um, pa uh, you know pair of stars in a binary system will merge sometime next year in 2022 in Cygnus. And so this documentary is basically the story of that and how they discovered this and all, all, all that jazz. And we'll be playing the 75 minute version. They have a version as long as 90 minutes, but we felt that was maybe a little long for uh, Zoom. So so we'll be playing the version that's uh, 75 minutes long. And if you do go to the uh, uh, KAS uh, schedule of events page, you know, the webpage with our full schedule, there's a, a link for the trailer that you can watch on there. So there's even a trailer for the documentary. It's about two minutes long. And that's what we do on next month. So again, you can't see this documentary anywhere else. You have to attend the general meeting. And this time you might ask, well, will it be recorded? And the answer is no, we can't do that. So you have to attend the Zoom meeting to see it or find some other club that's going to play it later because we can't record it because we'll, we'll, Calvin College will sue the heebie-jeebies out of us. <laughs> so, that's, so that's what we do doing next month. So without further ado, we will go ahead and officially adjourn.